First, our moderator, Time columnist James Ponowozik. James joined the magazine in 1999 after serving as media critic and editor at Salon.com. He's also a regular commentator for NPR's On the Media and All Things Considered, and we're delighted to have him here tonight. So please welcome James. And of course, Louis C.K. himself, one of the most admired comedians working today, who tempers his raw confessional material with warmth and humanity. A respected comedian since his emergence in the mid-80s, he's written for Late Night with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Dana Carvey Show, and The Chris Rock Show. Garner, what was that for, Dana Carvey or Chris Rock? Uh, garnering multiple Emmy nominations along the way. He also wrote the cult classic film Pootie Tang, won rave reviews for his series of HBO stand-up specials, and created and starred in the innovative series Lucky Louie. No, no less an authority on comedy than Ricky Gervais recently had this to say about Louis. I hope I don't embarrass you, but Louis C.K. is the funniest, bravest, and most honest stand-up com comic in the world at the moment. He mixes a classic observational style with a smart modern edge and deals with the most taboo subjects while remaining the likable underdog that carries the weight of an uncaring world on his shoulders. He's angry and right, a formidable comedy partnership. He went on to call Louis C.K. a true artist and Louis the show the most interesting and important comedy of the year. So please welcome Louis C.K. <clears throat> that was a lot of clips. <laughs> that was a lot. Well, that's all we have time for. for yeah, so. that was a lot. Um, no, seriously, I was thinking this before, but you know, I've, I've seen those yeah. clips several times, mm -hmm. and honestly, like those are you know just a couple of the best scenes I've seen of Thanks. anything you know this season. It's weird seeing them all strung together like that. It's a little there's something wrong with me, I think. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, the, the, the thing I was struck by just watching it now, I've watched them a bunch of times, but particularly the scenes from Bully and God, um, it was kind of played differently in a big room than I'd seen them before. Yeah. You know, and there were laughs where I wouldn't think there would be laughs, but, mm -hmm. but then it, it sort of makes sense because there's tension and it's mm -hmm. building the tension. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing kind of made me think, you know, do, like, do you think of the show as a, as a comedy or a drama or a comedy with part drama or a... <clears throat> well, it's a comedy, and I definitely, I feel sometimes a little irresponsible when I'm that unfunny. Uh, <laughs> but I also, to me, that stuff is really funny. Uh, it's not funny that you laugh, like in the earlier clips. And it is interesting to watch with the audience, because I've watched some pieces of the show with audiences. Like when we premiered, we had a party and stuff, and people came. So I watch people laugh, but watching people watch the bully scene is really intense uh, with an audience because it's so humiliating. And also, I, even though I shot it and deliberately made myself go through that, uh, it's painful to watch me. Uh, I mean, the kid's half my size. I probably could have taken him. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't fight. I'm not that guy. So anyway, it was really interesting to watch with an audience. But yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it's a con. The show's... Again, I, to me, it's really funny that a guy gets that debased and loses a woman over it. I think that's really funny. Um, and I mean, I may be wrong, but it is just my sense of humor tells me that the funniest thing that it, we did all season was that dude nailing the Jesus back yeah. up. Because he just had to, you know, it's got to be done. And it's just, <laughs> poor Jesus is like, I had 10 minutes off of there and I. Gotta go back up. I have a lot of sympathy for Jesus that I don't feel like the church had. That's why it's just so mean. And I feel like he did it the same way the Romans did. And it's just funny that a, a priest would tell him, get him, get him back up there. <laughs> All right, you know, I'll do it. So that's funny to me. And, and you know, it's not laugh, laugh funny the way that yeah. the earlier stuff is, but it makes me laugh. But it's funny when you sit down and you watch them, there's, you know, there's kind of thematic similarities between some of the really ha-ha-ha funny stuff and the, I mean, in the first, the Dr. Ben clip, yeah, um, you show your naked ass sure, and dead while a man makes you know, yeah. fun of your penis. Terrible and and, 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 and in penis. Bully, you're, you, you, obviously, you know, you've, you've got the character being 
what's more what's more difficult? What's harder to watch? Yes. What's harder to do? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely this is all this stuff is pretty yeah. uh, uh, self, you know, mutilating, <laughs> and uh, that's why it was a funny package to watch. Yeah, for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then having Amy Landecker, who I'm trying to fuck in one scene, and then she's my mom in the next yeah. scene. <laughs> Which is, you know, something I did consciously, but not, I didn't expect to ever see them back to back like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but one reason I did it is because at the end, she, when I watched, she auditioned before, for, she auditioned for the mom part before she, we, I even wrote Bully. But I kind of wrote Bully like in, a, in an hour. And then I threw it into production. And I threw mom aside and didn't, I mean, uh, the God thing. And so then uh, uh, she did Bully and she uh, do, nailed it. And then I started watching God auditions. I didn't even watch them. And I watched her do that. And at the end of the audition, she says, you want to get some donuts? And it was eerie because... <laughs> The whole yeah. donut thing in the bully scene. And uh, so I said, fuck it, I'm going to give her the part. But I never thought I'd watch. That's weird. It's <laughs> a little upsetting. Anyway. Well, you, you know, when, when I was thinking about what I was going to ask you about the show, I was working out questions in my mind. And I, I realized that I didn't even know how to phrase stuff because we'd be like, so in that scene where you such and such or you know do I say you do I say yeah. Louis like how, what do you think what do you how do you think it's, of that character is well that I mean you? it's is me it? I, I none of these things have ever happened to me I never broke into a church and dragged a Jesus off the cross and, <laughs> and uh, caressed him lovingly <laughs> <clears throat> that never happened but uh, I was scared to shit by the Catholic uh, church I was I was um I, when I was a kid, they, and they taught you about Jesus, they taught you that, those details. They made it as gruesome as they could, because that was the idea, was to impart the passion. That's the whole point of it. Mm. You tell kids this, every detail of it is remembered. It's a story, when you think about it, it's such an old story, but they tell you every detail. They tell you the amount of times that each thing was done to them and everything, so. And that, that you did it. What's that? Yeah, and then it was your fault. Yeah. On, I mean, it's not that simple, but they yeah. actually do tell it that simply to children. Mm. And that's when the shit goes in. They don't tell you. It's not like, you know, when they teach American history and they tell you Columbus discovered America, and then they start telling you, well, he didn't, it's not, he didn't really. It's all right. There were Vikings already, and that's, we, well, why'd you ever teach me that? Just because it's easier to say that, and then we tell you this part. But with <laughs> Jesus, they just tell you, you're bad, and he was sent here, and this is what happened, and all that stuff. So, yeah, what I, I, it's me up there, but it's, it's autobiographical fiction, I call it sometimes, because it's like it's it's the way I would act in those situations. But I'm being myself mostly. Al although I let myself make huge, terrible mistakes that I wouldn't make in real life, mm. um, and I let myself have worse judgment than I have in real life because it's it's more entertaining. <laughs> and I'd rather take it on myself than to like shine a light on other people who I think are bad. That's a boring thing to do. Mm. So I'd rather I'd rather take on the bad behavior and. Uh, and show it that way. Yeah. Another thing I think you get an accentuated sense of from those uh, clips is a thing that you do in the show where two, it has these two kind of opposite hallmarks, which is there's this very verite, realistic way that the show's presented, and it's also the, there are elements of complete surreality. Um, I, 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 I'm just wondering, first, you know, going back to the pilot, the, the helicopter at, at the, the, yeah. the end of the date. Um, yeah. what, is, what, is, what, is, what does this bring to the, what, what, do what, I, what is having these bizarre elements? Yeah, I mean, that's the reality. scene where I'm like on a very relatably bad date with yeah. a girl, everything is going wrong, and I'm just, I'm an ill fit to going out with a young woman. I'm not sure how I got the date to begin with. Uh, but uh, then at the end, I, I make this terrible, decision to try to kiss her after chewing her out. And I get this weird signal in my head that, hey, she wants me. And I start leaning in to kiss her. And she's so reviled that she runs into an already waiting and running helicopter <laughs> that takes her uh, you know, away. Uh, I don't know. It made sense to me. <laughs> it did. It just feels. It just felt right. It felt like something that ought to happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know. I have a lot of different reasons why I do things. I did, when we started, the, 
when we were getting ready to do the pilot, I told Blair, my line producer, I wanted to get a helicopter in the show somewhere. And uh, I th was thinking helicopter. I had shot this HBO pilot, and she found a really cheap helicopter guy. They're usually really expensive. But she found a really cheap guy, and he liked us. He liked when we did HBO. He just enjoyed the time he spent with us. So uh, I was writing that bit, and when I got to the end, I said, yeah, fuck it. She gets on a helicopter. <laughs> and, uh, and I love it. It feels right to me. When I'm watching the helicopter take off, it feels, that feels like the way I feel at the end of a lot of dates. <laughs> and uh, that's how bad it got. Uh, that, it went, that it went to a place that can't possibly really happen. Yeah. That's the way it feels sometimes. So uh, These are the kind of choices that I make that I know that some people would go, yeah, but she took me out of it. And then I'll, and my answer to it is like, okay, well, you know, if enough people say that, then I'll, I'll get canceled. <laughs> so there's, there's kind of a justice to it, you know? Yeah. As long as people like it, it, you know, some people won't. I get people email me angry things sometimes. That was bullshit, and they get mad. You know, if that happens enough, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing you've mixed up in the show is that there, there are elements of the show that are serial or that recur in episode mm -hmm. to episode. And on the other hand, you have two, two different moms and two different, I mean, not, yeah. not necessarily just the actress because of the age difference, but in character. Totally really different, different mothers, people. yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, 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 you know, so so do, do you think of every episode as just a short film entirely divorced from the others? Yeah, or? I take it on as each episode has, even not only just each episode, but each piece inside of each episode has its own goal. And uh, I don't know, I, I like to keep uh, trying different things. And I, I think in terms of baseball and boxing a lot, uh, and for baseball, to me, this is like, there was a pitcher for the Yankees once called Orlando Hernandez. They called him El Duque. And the, what made him so hard to hit was that he had many arm angles. Like, the, sometimes the ball would come from here, sometimes from here. You just didn't know what the hell. And I, I don't, I sometimes think of my relationship with the audience as an adversarial one. Like, I'm, you know, I want to keep them off their, I don't want them crowding the plate, you know? Uh, you, you have a fastball, and those are jokes. But then you have weird sliders and breaking pitches that make people nuts. They don't know when they're going to see what. Mm. I like putting audiences in that place where they're not, sure what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> because when you have them off balance, then you hit them with something simple and funny, then they, they go, oh my god, I can't believe I laughed. Because I was always starting to go like, I don't, I'm not into this <laughs> anymore. So I don't know. So to me, uh, uh, having different mothers, yeah, I had some feelings about, I had the idea of a mother that's totally narcissistic. She's really more my dad than my real mother has never been like that. Uh, but I thought, what if I was visited by a mother who was that terrible? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of people in my life that are that narcissistic. And so they kind of, I kind of, I meditated on that with that bit. Mm -hmm. And but this, for this, to tell this story, I wanted to really show what my mom was really like. Because she, that's a conversation in the car is almost exact. My mother called me afterwards and said, Jesus, that was like, that, that was like you had a video camera in our car, in my Pinto in the 70s. It really, we really had that conversation. Not because I tore Jesus off the cross. <laughs> Just because I, because I caught her in not believing it. That's what happened in real life. I said, so when Jesus did this, and she was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Do you believe in this? She's like, no. And then we had that conversation. And, and the beauty moment is that then at the end, the car doesn't start. Yeah. It seemed like something that had to come from life. Well, the, no, that didn't really happen. That was because I, didn't want to watch them get in, you know, drive. And I thought, it just happened when I was shooting it. I was like, yeah. you know what? Have the car not start. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And yes, people can think that it means there really is a God and he's <laughs> taken, he's made, taken this little petty revenge <laughs> on my mom. Like, that's how God, I love that people think that God is that petty. And he's like, you just, I mean, there couldn't be, if there is a Jesus, there couldn't be a worse thing a mother could do than to tell her son, you're off the hook, none of this happened, it's bullshit. And the idea that Jesus is watching, he's like, you know what, you're going to call AAA in a minute. <laughs> so you don't know, hope you believe in AAA, bitch. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. 
What else is going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, can you talk about, uh, a little bit about the, the, the deal that you have to do with the show? Because I understand it's, you know, it's kind of, it was kind of an unusual financial arrangement. With to, uh, the FX. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody having the situation that I have right now. Part of it is because I'm working for cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's happened before. Basically, I went into doing the show with a lot of um, uh, strength, negotiating-wise, because I didn't care if I had the job or not. I was, that's, there's nothing more powerful than just saying no to people. You know, If you say to somebody, please give me this, I swear I can do it, and here's why, they're not, it's, you're not going to go in well. But if you actually say, I don't, really, don't want to do it. I was on the road doing stand-up, and I was making a lot of money and enjoying my shows. <clears throat> so I didn't feel, I didn't want to go to Los Angeles. I live with my kids here in New York, and the most important part of my life is that I, I spend half of every week with my kids, and I don't have to work during that time. I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home dad from uh, Monday morning till about Wednesday, Thursday afternoon, and then I go on the road and do stand-up. It was perfect. And so I went out to L.A., and I did a theater show there, and a lot of people came, and it did well. And then NBC and Fox and all these people started throwing... Um, uh, offers to me to do a show, and they're a lot of money. And then I started to think, well, maybe I should do it for the money <laughs> because uh, I could stay home a little bit. And the show will never get on the air. There's no way <laughs> I'm getting on the air at NBC. But I, it's an old, that's, it's crazy. They pay you to fail. They pay you a huge amount of money just to sit there and think of an idea. And then you tell them the idea, and they go, nah, keep the money, though. It's a weird system. It makes no sense. <laughs> Anyway, this could be too long an answer. Let me cut right to the chase. I went to FX, and they, uh, they said, I didn't want to go to FX. My manager, Dave Becky, who's here somewhere, he's also an executive. You can thank that guy who was raising his hand for the show even existing. Because uh, <clears throat> I, he, he made a meeting for me and John. Uh, <clears throat> I'm hemming because I blanked on his name for a second. He's <laughs> my patron saint now. I'm fucking Landgraf, Landgraf and I. He made a meeting for us, and I canceled it. I called FX and said, I'm not going. I didn't feel like it. I, didn't want to do I don't like going to meetings. It's boring. <laughs> so I canceled the meeting at FX. And he called me and said, what? you can't cancel that. And I said, they don't have any money. Why the fuck would I want to work there? And he said, because this guy's really smart. And so I met John Langreff, and he said, we'd like to do a show with you, and we have a lot of freedom here. Um, but we could only pay you $200,000 to do the pilot. And that's, I was being offered like whatever, three, four hundred just to personally have as money by the other <laughs> <laughs> networks. So I said, well, okay, you're giving me 200,000, what's the budget for the show? And he said, no, that's the whole show. <laughs> it's what you get paid and what you spend on the show, $200,000. And I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> And uh, I told him I could do a sketch show for that. I could do a little sketch show. And he said, well, how about a sketch show about your life? And I was like, well, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> and so I went, I went home. And then he called me in my house. Langraf did. And he said, look, I get it. I get what you're doing. You want to be Charlie Sheen. That's what you're headed. It's funny now because he's naked. <laughs> <laughs> Yelling nigger on the streets and all that stuff. But I don't know why that's just what alcohol does to famous people. <laughs> Um, but anyway, Charlie, Charlie Sheen, to me, was, he was saying, you want to be a big star and in, on a big network? And, and I was getting sick, as he was saying, at the idea of that. But uh, he said, if you come in, I said, look, give me $200,000, and I'll do the show. But you can't. I'm not writing it and then sending you a script. You have to just give me the money, <laughs> and I'll send you a show, a DVD, in like three months. That's it. No between anything. I'm not pitching. I'm not even telling you what the show's about, <laughs> who's in it, how I'm doing it. You wire me the money. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't even want to have, because this is the way I figured was that I'm, I'm very lazy. I'm a lazy person. And unless I get excited about something. And I thought, if I have $200,000 of FX's money in an account, then I'll write something. <laughs> so I, that's, he said, I have no problem with that. And uh, so that's the way we did it. He literally wired me $200,000.
And at one point, Dave, God bless him, and my agent were trying to get, get it up. They were like m trying to get it to three or four. And then Landgraf called me and said, do you understand that I can write you a check? I can send you $200,000 from my desk. But if it's more than that, I have to go ask Rupert Murdoch for the money. And then you're going to have to explain to somebody what the show's about. You have to at least tell me what it's about. <laughs> and I said, OK, keep it at 200. <laughs> and I won't tell you anything. So he sent me $200,000. And I called Blair and all the people that I work with making films here in the city for years. And Paul Kessner, my great DP, who can shoot for nothing. And we decided to shoot on the red and make, we just, I started piecing the show together, not from what it even was about. I was like, I want to shoot a show that feels like short films, that's done with beautiful lenses, and that we shoot it uh, you know, carefully, um, like an old film crew. Um, I started thinking about the kind of people I would like to see in the show before I had written anything. And, uh, and then I started piecing together little scripts, and I ran out and shot one thing, and then stopped, and then wrote more. And I just kind of created it with, I just took the money and just threw it at objects and people. <laughs> and I shot way more than I needed. I shot like something like three episodes worth of material and uh, crunched it down to the pilot and uh, gave it to them. And they had no idea what they were going to see. They just pressed play, and they watched it. And that's a great trick, because usually they have to read the scripts, then they do rewrites, and they're sick of it. But they had no idea what the show was. And they watched it, and they said, yeah, let's keep doing it. And they gave me 300000 for the series per episode. That's it. I mean, I get paid out of that. I get paid Writers Guild minimum for the script, uh, DGA minimum for directing. Um, and I pay myself way, very little as an editor. Uh, and um, that's, I just make the show. And they don't, when we started doing the series, um, John Langraff said, well, can you tell, you, you got to tell me something. And so I, I said, uh, well, let's have a beer and let's talk about it. So we just sat and I told him three ideas for the series and I didn't do any of them. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, here's three ideas. I may or may not do them. And he said, sounds fine. And so that was it. Every week, <clears throat> we would take the money and we'd make shows. And also, I, they, I had the freedom to spend more on some shows than others. Some shows are, cost half a million bucks. Some shows cost 150, um, depend, dependent on the subject matter. Um, they didn't know who was in the show. I was more able to get interesting actors, people like Ricky, because they didn't know Ricky was on the show. Mm -hmm. They just, they watched and they go, how the fuck did he get Ricky Gervais? <laughs> 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 just watch it. That's Matthew Broderick? How the fuck? And they just, you know. So, and that was, to me, that was, it's much more fun to me. Doing the show this way is a lot of pressure. It's a huge amount of pressure. Because if the show stinks, if I give them an episode that stinks, then I have to do it over again. Mm. I mean, that's the, that's the deal that we have. They have a right to say, yeah, we just didn't like that one. And then I have to make another one. Yeah. So it's a lot of pressure, and also I want to I want to keep that freedom. I knew that if two episodes in, if the shows were weak, they would have come. It wasn't a contractual right; <laughs> it was just a verbal agreement. It remains a verbal agreement between me and John Langraff that I have that freedom. It's not a deal that I have. I mean, th that deal doesn't exist. They would <laughs> never put that on paper. That would be suicide. <laughs> It I mean, sounds it would like be, it comes out of petty cash. Yeah, like, it, it does. Just opens up a it does. Door and, it's literally, you know. my show is so cheap that the advertisers don't know what they're advertising on. That's how, it's so cheap to pay for that people will advertise on it without knowing what's, what's in it. I, mm. You know, red stripe beer doesn't give a shit. <laughs> 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 what I'm doing. So, but that's, I earn that right with every episode. Mm. If I start sliding downward and the show gets weak in their mind, They'll send people, and I'll have to, I'll have, to have every script uh, submitted to them, everything. That's, my contract says that I serve at their pleasure, and they have approval over everything. Mm. But that's not how we do it. Um, just a couple other things, and we'll try to get some, you know, we'll get some questions in sure. from, the, from the audience. Um, but it, related to that, it, you do so much on this show, mm. um, right? direct, edit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's almost something like, as much as this looks like a 21st century cable comedy, kind of old timey TV about it, but why do you, why do you kill yourself like that on, on this? Well, it's just so fun. I just love it. I, I love it. I like writing by myself because these are all like first drafts, really. Like, I, I like this show to feel like it's right out of my gut or brain or balls, one of the three. 
um, <clears throat> without it going through a process. I can tell when I watch television that it's gone through a process, and I know the process because I've been there. But I, I can, I think audiences do too, even though they don't know. They know they're what they're being bullshitted with. They know they're watching something that has a system to it, and it's not fun because they can see it. They can see the the moves now, mm -hmm. you know. And that's because we take scripts in TV shows and we give them to a, a room full of really good professionals, and they perfect the scripts. But you can only when you perfect, you take them in the same direction as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I tend to write stuff and then leave it alone and trust the first burst idea of how the dialogue is written and everything. And I'll slash and cut it, um, but I don't. Uh, I don't rewrite a lot. Uh, but then I meticulously shoot it, so I'm taking something that was barely thought through, and I'm, I execute it as a director much more carefully. Um, and I could never do that. If I had a writing staff, they would never let me do that. It would be much harder, and also would be you know, 12 times more expensive in the writing department. And as a director, I can pay myself shit, and uh, I, I think I'm worth it. Uh, so, so, you know. I love it. I love, I love going to the set every day and getting to shoot this stuff. It's so fun. Um, and the autonomy just greases the wheels. It makes it easy. I can write pages while I'm shooting and change stuff or, you know. The, 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 um, the story that you told about uh, uh, having the same actress play um, your date and, and yeah. your mom, I think I'd first heard that because um, I think you posted that in response to uh, uh, it was a review of one of the episodes at the, yeah, at, no, at the I, AV I, Club. Yeah, I I Google myself too much, I think. And, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried because it's sort of the flip side of that solitary auteur mm -hmm. approach that, you know, mm -hmm. you now exist as a creator in this world where there are a zillion opinions out there and you can read every word that's written about you. And you actually in, engage with, with um, some, you know, some of your, your critics and, and fans. Um, you know what? 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 What do you, what do you get out of that? Is it, is, yeah, is it's it, not a good idea. Mind, yeah. <laughs> Every, I, I really I shut up, I shut down my Facebook and MySpace and all this stuff I used to have because I don't think it's healthy for me to have access. I should. I'm close to shutting Twitter down uh, because I say things I shouldn't say on Twitter too. Because <laughs> I, I can't. I just I'm a, I, I have a bad form of Tourette's that I can't really resist. It's not that's not a nice to say because that's a real condition, but uh, maybe hey maybe I got it I don't know, but uh, but uh, in that case you know it's really narcissistic sitting there googling your name and ooh somebody wrote a thing on a blog in Turkey about my show I'm gonna <laughs> see what he has to say. It's really gross and I've tried to actually temper it because there was a, such a massive amount of. Uh, stuff to read for this show, and so I had to actually say, "Stop doing this! This is disgusting." Um, but I'm—it's you know—I'm a comedian. I work my my whole life revolves around getting you know feeling the laughs and or the not laughs or feeling the. Cha it's not all that I need laughs. It's like the challenge of getting a laugh or the challenge of getting through a dry spot in a show. I'm all about the audience. So when you produce this stuff and then just let it go on the air, it's nice to. It's fascinating to see what people think of your material. And the folks that were asking questions about the two moms were intelligent. I just enjoyed the conversation. Mm. It's like I went to a party and they were talking about my show and I was wearing a fake mustache or something over my real mustache. <laughs> and, uh, and they were having a conversation that was imp compelling to me. Mm. And I said, well, I actually know why I did it. So I'll tell them. Because I liked them. I liked the people that were talking. If somebody had written, why did that fucking faggot make two fucking different chicks his mom? What a douchebag. I would have left it alone, because that's not as interesting. Although, I don't know, maybe I would have answered him, too. I don't know. Because, you dick, I wanted to. <laughs> well, in that spirit, uh... <laughs> We go, should, we, should we go to the room and, uh, oh, I guess I have to pick people. Um, let's do the Georgetown shirt uh, over, oh, you can't see the shirt. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guy Forrest back here. Thanks a lot. And thanks sure. for being so generous as a comedian. I think yeah, I, we all really appreciate it. Um, two quick questions. This kind of intricately exploring your moral core 
in all these like horrible lapses in morality and everything. Does that go all the way back to you starting as a comedian? You know, because you said you started in high school, so I was wondering if that was true. And then also, how did you get into directing, and how did you learn about directing? And direct, you know, along the line. Well, uh, when I was, I started stand up in high school, and I didn't care about my moral core. Or whatever. I don't think I have one of those, but. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think about that. I just wanted to try to be funny. Uh, several years of, that's why it really takes like 20 years to make a good comedian, because at least for the first 10 or 12, for the first 10 years, you're just trying to learn to be funny. So you just come up with, hey, maybe a joke about rocks would be good. And you <laughs> apply your comedy knowledge to rocks. And, and then you try current events for a while, and they, those come and go. And then you're also sort of joining a chorus of hate when you do that. And uh, so you try all this stuff, and it, none of it, some of it works, and then you start hating it. So after 10 years of learning how to be funny and how to just do the work of being a comedian, like just like learning piano, it's like if you were learning piano on really shitty pieces, but you are getting the skill. And then you go through five years or so of reject, realizing that you've wasted 10 years <laughs> talking about nothing <laughs> to drunks in bars and it's too late to go back and do anything else with your life, it's a bad time. So then you have five years of just like repeating the shit you've been doing and not knowing why, and then either you bottom out or you go write for a better comedian, or you give up or kill yourself, <laughs> or something else comes in and gives you, you got something else that you want to talk about. So other shit came to me that I wanted to talk about. So I changed in that way. I learned how to direct, uh, uh, I lo worked for local access cable TV station in Newton, Massachusetts, where I grew up, and I learned how to run video cameras and how to edit. Uh, I shot uh, hockey games for my high school and stuff like that, and then I'd do like little art pieces, and then I'd, I'd take the cameras home and make my own little funny videos. That's kind of where I started. And then every time I had any little bit of money from doing stand-up, I would make short films. I made short films th throughout <laughs> My years, you know, I, they, the short films for me go back to, I don't know, 89 or something like that. And I go to festivals with them. It's just something I've always loved. I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to college. Um, on the aisle here in the red. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this. This is really, really um, valuable. I just want to know what you have to say about censorship in terms of being a stand-up. Uh, you probably had to clean up your act when you did like Conan or Letterman and stuff, and you're someone whose act is not clean. How do you deal with being told all the time, you must be clean, you must be clean, but knowing in your bones that you're not someone who is, you know, like, <laughs> you're someone who, yeah. you're someone who swears a lot, and yeah. you know that's your essence or whatever. What's your advice? Well, it, it's, uh... It, you know, it's all about the venue, like where you're working is what decides what you get to say. I never felt, uh, I mean, I, I don't get why we can't all say anything we want on TV. I don't, nobody's ever explained to me why that isn't illegal. <laughs> I don't get why there's an FCC that can make those rules. I don't understand it. It doesn't jive with what I understand about America and the First Amendment. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, they're just words, right? What? They're just words. Yeah. But, Want to let me finish? <laughs> uh, but when you're working for a network, the FCC rules aren't usually the, the challenge. It's every network has a standards and practices person. And uh, networks that go over the air are the ones that you have to have an FCC thing. But cable, uh, you can say whatever you want. But it's the, as far as the law, but every network has their set of rules because they, it's not just, you know, none of us have a right to be on TV. It's not, it's their channel. I mean, they set the fucking thing up. They bought a big dish and they have a satellite, they have a satellite. They launch satellites into space. So for them not to have the right to decide what's on it, I think is stupid. I think they, I, it's really boring to me when anybody in TV goes like, well, assholes won't let me do it. Well, it's their fucking, why can't they enjoy what they put on too? And the way they pay for all that shit is advertising. And so they have sort of a, they, every place hires somebody who's there to kind of, who just knows where they're gonna get in trouble and lose money. That's all, it's money. I mean, everything has to be paid for. Uh, anyway, when you do Conan shows like that, it's really, it's harder because it's the FCC, it's the airwaves. 
And uh, it's a game, though. It's kind of fun. I had, I had show, jokes improved by censorship. When I was at uh, Conan, I did stand-up on the show, and I knew the standards guy because I was a writer. So I could actually, he t I did a joke about Giuliani at the time, who was the mayor of New York, and he was angry because somebody threw shit on a, piece, on a picture of Jesus or so. I don't know what it was. It was something where somebody made a piece of art that was they smeared elephant shit on a picture of Jesus' mother. Uh, don't get mad at me. It's somebody did that. <laughs> somebody did that, and Giuliani shut the funding down. And so, and he said, people pick on Catholics. That's the problem, is that everybody feels like they can pick on Catholics. And I had this joke where I said, yeah, it's true, people pick on Catholics, but that's just because they're wrong about God. <laughs> and uh, it's just a brazen asshole joke. So I, I wanted to do it on Conan, and the Sanders guy said, no way. So I called him, I said, I think I should, I learned how to argue with Sanders people. I said, I think I have a right to say this, because he's on the news saying his half so it's an equal time issue and he goes all right but find out how can you say it that's not so offensive I don't want to get phone calls so we talked about it he had this idea he said um, what if you sound first of all really sympathetic when you say it's true people do pick on Catholics a lot but that's because they're wrong about God like he said if you make it like a sillier turn you show some sympathy, and then it's going to be clear you're joking when you say that. And I did it, and it got a way bigger laugh. Like, it was an improvement. <laughs> so, I don't know. That was a fun exercise to me. It's, a me it's an intellectual exercise, the, the censorship sometimes. Uh, FX is very different. They don't, it, I, I don't understand how they're letting me do this shit. I don't. <laughs> I don't understand it. When I handed in the God episode, that's the one I was the most worried about because it was barely funny and it was insane. And, it's, and I'd say this shit about Jesus. I mean, it's crazy. Usually Jesus and the church is the one place you can't touch on television. It's the one place where no standards person will let you fuck around. And I was worried about that episode and I handed it in. Um, it was one of the last ones and nobody called me. Usually they call me right after they watch it. Nobody called. <laughs> and I got really scared. Because every single episode up until then, they'd call me right, and I knew they'd watched it. I knew literally they watched it on a server that I control, and I know when it's been watched. I know, it's some crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I knew they watched it, and nobody called me, and then I'm waiting, and then the next day I write my, the one uh, guy I have there, executive, who's very sympathetic, and I wrote him, I said, hey, did you like it? No answer. And then I called him, and he didn't call me back. And I, it, I was getting really upset. And then I got a call, I got an email from him saying, you must call me this instant. And I was like, this is, it's over. Because of Jesus. <laughs> so I call him and he said, uh, in 20 minutes, uh, we're going to announce that your show's picked up for a second season. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, I wasn't even thinking about that or expecting it, or I really thought we were probably going to get canceled and... I was like, what? And he said, yeah, just don't tell anybody. You have 20 minutes, you have to keep it a secret. And he hung up on me. <laughs> and then I called him back and I said, wait a minute, what about the God episode? And he goes, oh, it's great. It, don't touch it. It's great. <laughs> it's great. No notes. We love it. So, and I did. We, Standards and I had some issues with the God episode. But I think she helped it, too. She's a, there's a woman there, and she's brilliant. She's very smart. And her goal is to keep the show as irreverent as possible by keeping it away from any place where it's going to get it. Because if I piss off somebody enough, they're going to, you know, it takes one person to go, and then the party's <laughs> over. So. Oh, uh, it's up to him. What am I doing? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, on the aisle in back. Uh, yeah, probably you're right next to you. Um, when did you know you were a good comic? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> he's still got the mic like he's ready with more. Um, no, I, I don't know. I, uh, when I first did it, I bombed really bad. I was so out of sorts. It was the worst thing I'd ever, that had ever happened to me the very first time I did it. And I did it a second time just because I wanted to know if it was really that bad, if it was just a bad night. And it was worse. <laughs> And so that was when I was in high school. And then I didn't do it again for almost a year. 
And then I went to this weird offbeat place in Cambridge, Massachusetts that was just fun, weird. It was a uh, off the wall cinema. It was a place where you would watch like uh, Dada films and eat carrot cake. <laughs> and uh, they did stand up comedy midnight on Saturdays. So I went to the show and it was really weird show, strange, trippy comedians. And I tried it there and I had a really great set. That was my third time on stage. And I thought, I can do this. And then I bombed several times after that, but I didn't care. Because that one set really got the hook in me. So that's, I, I didn't know if I was good at it. I just thought, I have, a, I have a way that this is something I could do that I enjoy. People laughed. You know, those 14 people in that club were responsible for a lot because <laughs> if I'd bombed that third time, I probably would have. I probably wouldn't be alive <laughs> at all. I don't think I had a shot at anything else, really. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, white shirt in the center there. A couple rows back. I was wondering if you would comment about your time with the Dana Carvey show. Uh, talk about any creative process or anecdotes that you have <laughs> from that. And secondly, uh, the way that that show was handled, did that impact what you fight for with creative control or what sort of impact that had? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, that show was a really difficult time for me. It was bad. I mean, I hated it. And it's a good show, but I had a hard time. Dana was, uh, you know, hot coming out of SNL, and ABC gave him a show um, and said, we want you to be edgy and irreverent and be really out there. And then uh, while we were starting to produce the show, uh, ABC was bought by Disney, like literally in the middle of our pre-production. And then they just a whole different people, group of people came and said, uh, yeah, you, they put Dane on the cover of time, TV Guide with uh, or Kermit the Frog with his arm around Kermit the Frog. And he never posed for that picture. Dana was furious to see himself whole, you know, with his arm around Kermit the Frog. You know, like him and Kermit were at the China Club and then somebody came over and he goes, oh yeah. And uh, that was it. The show had such a, uh, you know, it was very, everything we did made somebody mad. But I learned, did learn from that. What, one thing I learned was that there wasn't any need for us to be on, we were on prime time television. The show was like at nine o'clock at night on ABC. It was just a mistake. Those people didn't want to see us. And I read letters, like handwritten letters by people. There was no email then. You got handwritten letters from old ladies saying, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> You know, I just, I, I learned from that kind of like, you gotta go where you're wanted, you know? So I'm on FX and it's, you know, they had, I remember when I was trying to find what the line was on FX, there was, I was watching The Shield and there is a scene where a woman has been raped and murdered and somebody says, oh, and he ejaculated on her stomach. And then they snap zoom in to a pool of jizz on a dead lady's, <laughs> on a dead lady's stomach. And a friend of mine, Vernon Chapman, who's a great comedy guy, he said, you should, because we're not allowed to show boobs on the show, he said, you should have a, a shot of a woman who's naked and cover her boobs with the jizz on the stomach of a dead lady. <laughs> like, this is okay. <laughs> Beautiful, life-giving breasts are not okay. The mother's milk, gorgeous. Michelangelo <laughs> made us cry when he painted them, not okay jizz on the stomach of a dead woman. <laughs> totally. Why, why are you even asking? So, so when I, me, that's, so that, that's I, I should be on a network that lets you do that. I should be, I should not, this show should never be on anywhere else. If I got some weird call from NBC saying we want it, I'd say no. You're fucking wrong. The people who watch your network don't want this. It's not fair to them. So I kind of learned that from Dana Carvey. That was a hard show to work on, though. It was just a lot of hours. I was there all night, every night. I, was, I cried like a lot on that show. <laughs> like I wept like a baby from exhaustion and, and just pressure. It was hard. And I was in tw my 20s. I was like 25 years old. So it was a lot. And I was the head writer. It was a lot of, a lot of pressure. I'm glad I did it. It's a huge education. Um, it's a young lady uh, on the aisle here. There you go. 
Are the scenes with the uh, other comics improvised, or is it totally scripted, like with Nick DiPaolo? The, the, the poker scene was scripted uh, as far as once we start really talking about uh, gay sex and asking those questions. And also the thing of all the stuff, most of the stuff of me talking about packing dicks into his mother's ass <laughs> was it's about a half scripted, a half. But once we shot the scene once, it was a really long day because we shot the scene once, like scripted, and then I gave everybody a shot at screwing around and improvising, and then we all started getting a little punchy, and everybody started saying funny shit about wearing flip flops and stuff, and then we kept shooting to get that, and then everyone was so warmed up that I was like, guys, can I just have the scene as written all over again on everybody's close up? And they were like, fuck, and I made them do that. Everybody's happy because the scene came out good, but it was a lot. It was both, we kept shifting from scripted to, um, to some improvised. I, I don't usually do much improving in uh, this show because we shoot it like cinema, we shoot it you know, with a lot of coverage and we pick lenses carefully. So it's a kind of, if you improvise once, you kind of have to. But this scene ended up cutting together nicely because uh, we didn't follow the script and I, uh, the camera kept kind of going around in this spiral circle, this kind of the way we shot it in this weird spiral. And I liked that we would catch sometimes in the middle of a move and some, some of the dialogue is clipped. Um, I liked that. So that's how we did that one. Um, stripes in front here. Um, in your mind, do you have a filter between topically, like what is good for stand-up and what is good for the show? Are there things in the show, topics or scenes, that you would want to do stand-up but just don't work? Or how do you differentiate for yourself? Well, it's one other thing I love about doing this show is that it all comes from the same place. Like, uh, I kind of think of every episode as a stand-up set. And some things are said with my face and some are said with a lot of people's faces. And uh, the subjects cling together in the, about as much as they do on stage. That I'll talk about something and sometimes I'll, I'll talk about something else tangentially or I'll just suddenly just change the subject because I feel like it. So the show does that sometimes. Sometimes it's following a line, and sometimes it just goes, uh, anyway, you get it. Here's this now. Uh, so uh, every, but it's, it's a great, for me, it's great because every time I have an idea of an area to talk, to do on the show, I can just make that choice. I, if it's not coming together as stand-up material, oh, well, maybe I should be showing this. So it's kind of 50-50. I mean, it's whatever. It depends on the subject. The gay thing, the, the poker thing, that was a real conversation I had with that comedian uh, years ago. And I thought, I should tell that story on stage. But then I thought, I'm not going to stand there and tell that story. It was his story. And I actually got him to, you know, that, that's the real guy. He's just a comedian from here in New York. So that was one, one thing where I thought about it on stage first and then thought I'd shoot it. Uh, all right, we got time for one more, uh, I think. I hate this godlike power. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> Right, right, right in the yeah, center. With nobody the, over there. Okay, nobody over there asked anything. I mean, yeah, they want to. Uh, all right, uh, right next to you there. Hi. Oh, my voice is horrible on this. Uh, I'm a film production student, and um, what is the? I actually wrote a script and based it off you and your show, and because uh, I like your tone, and uh, what is the best advice you can give for like a student and like attitude? when you're doing that, because you kind of say a big F you to a lot of people, and I like that. Say, you mean, at, what's I like you, attitude when you're, um, what attitude when, you when you're, yeah, when you're in the production, which you've done it all, it's, and what, what's the best attitude to really get? The best attitude in production is really, uh, uh, really wanting to help a lot. Uh, really wanting to help whoever's show it is uh, be really great. I mean, just, I mean, I think that's anybody who's doing any job, yeah. really. She'd want that job to be done really well. I mean, this is a simple answer, but it's really true. Yeah. Uh, there's one person really usually that has an idea of how to do something. And everybody else should really want, I mean, it's such a rare and great gift to get a job in show business. It's very, very, it's not, you're not going to get one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, statistically, you're, you're, you're not. So. You know, it's like when, when unemployment is like a 2%, they say it's full employment. Like, it's, that's how low your odds are <laughs> that statistically you're not going to get a, a job that you really want in show business. So if you do, holy shit. 
What if I was and, and the way I would approach it is I want to do everything I can to make myself valuable to these people. That's, that's when you do it, when you're in production and you just see somebody kicking ass and wanting what they do to go well, um, you just never forget them. I mean, I have people I've kept around uh, for years and years and I just beg, there's people that don't want to do this shit anymore and I beg them to stay on for me. That my DP, uh, Paul Kessner, is a genius, but he wants to be on a boat all the time. He has a fucking boat, and he takes it to the Bahamas and shit. And so every time when we got season two, he's, it, he's the only one who didn't want to hear it. I'm like, we got picked up, and he's like, uh. And I'm like, please get off the fucking boat. Because he's so eager to make what I see in my head real. That's, and so, that's the way, all the way up to the very closest person. And then actually when you're the person who's running the thing, which is definitely not gonna happen to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to impress upon you how, if you get there, how rare that ex chance is gonna be and how important it is to seize it. If you get to be the person who gets to run the thing, then you have to kind of turn the same attitude on them that you have to enable all those people to do their jobs and. And I'm, I'm just the directorial department. I'm also the writing department and the editorial department um, and the uh, lead actor. But, uh, but I just run those parts of the show. Everybody else has to, I have to know what they do. I know what everybody does because I was an intern. I mean, I, 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 I carried camera cases. I did everything and I hung lights in studios. So I know everything that goes on. So I know what I'm asking people to do. I know what I'm asking them to take on. I think it's arrogant to think that you can just force your will on a crew of people. It's, you've got to be a human being if you're a director or if you're a sound person. When I was shooting Pootie Tang, there was a young <laughs> chick who was the, boom, we had a boom operator, it was this young student who came on for one day and we're all ready to shoot this really intricate s shot and she didn't like how she had the boom so she just went, wait a minute, I'm not ready. <laughs> and everyone was like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Because she was being belligerent and shitty. And so the person who we replaced her with was a real human being. They, were just, they treated, us, treated us like human beings. Everybody just wants to be treated de decently. It, it, life's too short to be an asshole as an employer or an employee. So if everybody, yeah. If everybody likes the work and everybody wants the show to be as good as possible and everybody treats each other with respect, the show's gonna be, and I, we have so much fun on this show because we don't have anybody on the set who everyone goes, oh, Jesus. I mean, it, it may be me. <laughs> and then there's only one then, so, you know. I, the only question I wanna answer, because everybody asks it, is about the middle finger during the opening credits. Uh, I know somebody here wants to ask it, so I'm gonna answer it. During the opening credits of the show, some guy flips off the camera. It was a young uh, NYU looking kid. Um, <laughs> spiky hair and just real contrary and he was walking with some real, yeah, fuck everything type. I mean, I really, I was eating the pizza and I saw them and I, was, I already thought, Jesus. And they walked by and they were like, cause they saw a camera and they saw people making a sincere effort at something. It was <laughs> like, just offensive to them. So one of them went, yeah, and he flipped off the camera. And I remember that moment very well because I was eating the pizza and I watched him flip off the camera and I could tell by the angle that we caught it. And I thought that's, it. when that happened, I knew we were gonna be on TV. <laughs> because that was when we were shooting the pilot and it was a test to see if we could get it. But for, for some reason, I remember seeing that and thinking, that's just meant to be, that that's gonna be in the opening credits. It'll be fuzzy, because I fucking know how the camera works. It's gonna be a little fuzzy, because it's out of the depth of field, um, and, and people are gonna see it. I just knew, that was just a sign to me, <laughs> that we would get to be on TV. So there is a God. There is a God, he gave me the finger. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, Louis C.K., thank you thank very you. much. <laughs>